welcome everyone. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Matthias, Professor Matthias Stuber, who is going to be chairing the session today. And uh, he will be introducing our speaker and I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pina. Uh, welcome everybody in the room. Thank you for all of those who made the effort to come here. And thanks also for those who dialed in uh, remotely online. And please remember to mute your microphones if you are not asking questions or participating at the discussion. But now it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce Aaron Bagish. Um, Aaron's, Aaron, since almost a year, I think, uh, has been at, uh, at the UNIL. So he's in part at the ISU. There is a sports institute at the UNIL on the one hand, and on the other hand, he also works in cardiology up at the SHUV, also seeing patients. Um, prior to his move to Switzerland, he directed the cardiovascular uh, performance program at the Mass General Hospital in Boston in the United States. And notably, he has served as a team cardio cardiologist of many, many well-known teams. This includes U.S. soccer, U.S. rowing, the New England Patriots, for those of you who are not familiar with it, this is American football, then the Boston Bruins, uh, which is ice hockey, and also the, the New England Revolution, which is uh, soccer. And on top of that, he's also um, intimately involved with the, with the FIFA. I think a lot of the time you're spending up in, in Zurich um, to deal with FIFA and all that. I, I would be interested in hearing what, is, what that is about, because the FIFA... Uh, makes it to the news quite often. <laughs> um, and then, of course, uh, he has been the medical director of the Boston Marathon. And sadly, he was among the first responders uh, during the Boston Marathon and uh, when the bombing happened. And uh, of course, he is one of the world leading re researchers on heart function and disease in athletes. And he has published well over 200 articles in journals like the New England Journal of Medicine, the Annals, uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, PNAS, Circulation, and so forth, and so forth. And even though we are not supposed to count citations and look at age indices anymore in the scientific landscape, I do it anyways I can because I'm old. Um, he has collected well over 22,000 uh, 22, citations and has an impressive age index of 75. So he will talk about about uh, product and technology development, I think, which is very interesting for many of us who are engineers in the context of cardiovascular uh, complications in response to sport. Aaron, it's such a privilege to have you here. We are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Matthias. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Some of you I've met before at the retreat last summer. Some of you I've met not, but uh, again, thank you for the invitation. I thought what I would do this morning is spend some time talking to you about the rapidly growing field of sports cardiology, which is when heart doctors are asked to take care of competitive athletes with heart problems. And in doing so, present to you not only what we know, but more importantly, what we don't know. So that those of you that are thinking about application of imaging technology or perhaps development of new products, I can start planting some seeds in your mind about how you may be able to help us move the field in the right direction. So without further ado, these are disclosures that I have financial affiliations with and funding sources either active or past from my prior lab. But what I want to do is just start you thinking about the athlete, the athlete in the world, not in the hospital, but in the world outside the hospital. And historically, when we talk about competitive athletes, we have to remember that the, the triangular paradigm has been an athlete that interacts on a daily basis with a coach, maybe a physio, and some form of sports medicine doctor, either an orthopedic surgeon or a primary care sports medicine doctor. And those of us that practice cardiovascular medicine, we're very much left out of this care paradigm, which has been a problem historically because this introduces distance between doctor and patient. It introduces division between primary care team and subspecialists. And most importantly, up until the last decade or so, heart doctors have been very unfamiliar with the problems that athletes develop so that when we need to care for them, we're not well equipped. Why is this important? It's important because no matter what type of sport you look at, whether you're talking about endurance sports like triathlon or running events, 
or gym sports like CrossFit, or perhaps all of the unique, wonderful sports that make up Switzerland, the number of people that are pushing their bodies hard, particularly at an older age, is increasing every year. So what this means is that the number of people that identify as athletes will go up and up and up. And these people, as I will try to impress upon you, are healthy most of the time, but when they're not, they're not. And we need to understand why this happens. So things are changing. They're changing both in the United States as well as in Europe. The concept of the care team of the athlete is evolving and it's getting more complicated, particularly at the elite levels of sport. Now, instead of just a coach and a sports medicine doc, you have lawyers, you have administrators, you have agents, you have family members. But importantly, now, according to the American College of Cardiology and the ESC, the sports cardiologist represents a primary member of the athlete care team, which means we have to be ready to work with these people on a daily basis, and we have to be ready to help them when questions and concerns arise. So I just want to quickly walk you through a series of papers so you can see over the last decade how this field has evolved in, in, in America. Uh, but I will tell you that almost the same parallel set of papers has been produced here in Europe. And one of the most important things I'm trying to do as an American now living in Switzerland full time is to merge what happens in America with what happens in Europe so that we have a unified voice rather than two sets of papers, two sets of voices, because those days should be gone. But this is how things evolved in the United States. The first was getting the American College of Cardiology to buy on and understand the concept of sports cardiology. The second was to develop a set of guidelines, and I'm going to talk more about this in a minute, that we can use when we meet an athlete that has a heart problem to decide whether that athlete should be allowed to play sports or not. The next was to get the largest governing body for sport in the United States, which is our National Collegiate Athletic Association. You'll all be aware of the fact that sports in the U.S. and in Europe differ primarily based on the role of the colleges and universities. In Europe, university sport is not a big thing. In the United States, your university sport is the feeder to everything beyond, including professional sports and Olympics. So it was very important to get this group to help us work collectively. The next was to talk about the electrocardiogram and to remind doctors specifically that the electrocardiogram, which is the primary tool we use to screen for heart disease and to look for heart conditions, looks very different in athletes and in non-athletes. And so we needed to develop criteria to help people understand that. The next was to develop an educational curriculum. And this was really an opportunity to teach young people going through training how to work with athletes with heart disease. And then finally, probably most relevant to us in this room was the first set of imaging guidelines. So a comprehensive document talking about the use of CT, echo, MRI for this specific population. And I'm going to focus a lot of my talk this morning on how we use imaging, but also some of the problems with imaging and the opportunities for future improvements. So the field has evolved, um, but there are two major issues that we have left to reconcile. The first has to do with young athletes. These are all athletes I've cared for that I've learned a lot from. And the second has to do with older athletes. I want to just spend a few minutes talking about this younger athlete issue. And the bottom line is that the concept of paternalism, which is where the doctor tells the patient what to do without a discussion, is over. No longer can a patient walk into a doctor's office and be told by a doctor this is what's happening. There is now a discussion between patient and doctor. And while this is good, this introduces some challenges around when an athlete can and should play sports after a diagnosis. So let me explain to you how this looks. Historically, we've had a document in the U.S. called the 16th Bethesda Conference, and you've had one in Europe here, which was written in 2005, which is entitled Recommendations for Competitive Sport Participation in Athletes with Cardiovascular Disease. Both of these documents list every conceivable heart problem that an athlete could have, and they then go on to say that if an athlete has any of these heart problems, their days of playing sports are over, with the exception of these five sports. So that means if you're a footballer or a Nordic skier and you end up with a heart problem, your options include bowling, <laughs> cricket, curling, <laughs> golf, and riflery. Yes. Most athletes don't want anything to do with those five games. We may call them games or sports, but these were our options up until very recently. This has changed, and I'm just going to show you the, the European guideline um, and give you one specific example. Now, in 
2023, we no longer have the right to tell people you can only play cricket, curling, bowling, riflery, golf. We have to think about their disease. We have to talk to them about the risks and benefits of playing sport with that disease. And then we have to work with them to come up with a plan. And oftentimes this plan involves enabling an athlete to get back onto the playing field, even with some element of risk. So for those of you that live here in Europe, you'll remember last year, the very famous televised case of Christian Eriksen, Danish soccer player who went down on the pitch during the European Championships. He had a cardiac arrest. He was resuscitated. He went to the hospital. He received a defibrillator. And the very first question that Christian started asking is, when can I start playing football again? And so many of us from the, around the world participated in that decision-making process with him. And as you'll know, just several months ago, you saw it on television. He was back in action, leading his team at the World Cup very successfully. So that's an example of how this process has changed. Had Christian had that event five years ago, he would have never seen the pitch again. Now, is this right or wrong? I don't know, but this is the way things are moving. So turns out that if we're going to do this, and this process is called shared decision-making, we have to have a standardized approach. And what a standardized approach means is a framework by which we can sit with an athlete, their family members, their loved ones, their coaching staff, their team leadership, and say, we have a new diagnosis. There are some things we know and some things we don't know. But at the end of this process, what we'd like to do is come to a decision that is the best fit for the athlete, the best fit for the team, and one that integrates the medical information that I know. So this is a stepwise approach that we now use, and we're learning as we go with this, but it begins with making sure we understand what the diagnosis truly is, risk stratification, which helps us put people into a low risk and a high risk situation, education, importantly, understanding who the patient is. If an athlete tells you that nothing in their life matters as much as sport, that's a very different thing than an athlete that tells you, oh, you tell me I can't play anymore, I'm fine with that. That's patient preferences and values, coming to a decision-making, engaging other stakeholders, the many, many people that are going to be affected by that decision, implementing it, and then following the person long-term. So as it relates to young competitive athletes, the single most important unanswered question is what happens after this process? Do we improve people's lives or do we put them at risk for having bad events down the line or both? And we simply don't know. So stay tuned. This is the next five to 10 years. We're going to learn a lot about this. What I really want to focus on today, though, is not the young people, but the older people. Uh, this is Ted Kakis. Ted is an American um, who, at the age of 75, won every single international rowing regatta in the world. He's the fittest 75-year-old I've ever met. And I use Ted as an example of, how, of what we define as the <clears throat> master's athlete. So these are men and women above the age of 35 who exercise vigorously for at least five hours a day with an emphasis on goals. And when I say goals, I mean they do this either to compete or to perform for their own self-worth or to lose weight. There's some goal that they go into their exercise and their sport with. And because of that, they're driven to keep going no matter what gets in their way. What's most interesting about Ted is he won all these races with coronary disease, atrial fibrillation, and a large aorta. So the question Ted asks me every time I see him is, what's going on with my heart? Should I be worried? And why is my heart not perfectly healthy? Because I've done everything right for the last 75 years. So to make things more complicated, um, just 10 years ago, this is when I was about 10 years into my career thinking all was good, athletes were always healthy. The Wall Street Journal published this editorial entitled One Running Shoe in the Grave. And what the editorialist wrote is that running can take a toll on the heart that essentially eliminates, eliminates the benefits of exercise. Running too far, too fast, and for too many years may speed one's progress toward the finish line of life. So I had no idea where I was on November 27th, but when I got to work on November 28th, I had 465 emails in my in-basket asking about this article. And these were all people that I had cared for or were part of the exercise endurance community around the world who wanted to know, should we stop exercise? Because maybe you can get too much of a good thing. And maybe what we think is good is actually bad. So the Wall Street Journal based their editorial on this scientific piece here, which was written in the, the British journal Heart. It was written by two of my friends, two American cardiologists, Jim O'Keefe and Chip Labby, both good guys. 
And they put together a thoughtful opinion piece called Run for Your Life at a Comfortable Speed and Not Too Far. I could spend all day talking about this article, but basically what you need to know is that they use four lines of evidence to make the claim that you can get too much exercise. And in fact, we should probably do less exercise than what we're taught. They looked at some old epidemiologic data. They looked at some new studies on cardiac imaging and athletes, which I'll show you in some detail. They gave some case reports of healthy, fit people dying during sport. And they also made the point that for the first time, scientists are starting to study people on the high end of the physical activity spectrum and asking the question, can we get too much with a good thing? Now, it turns out that if you look carefully at all of these lines of evidence, they don't hold up at all. Um, I don't know how this got through the peer review process, although I do because it was internally peer reviewed and commissioned. So there was no thoughtful critique of this paper. Uh, if you're interested, um, Jim O'Keefe gives a great TED talk in which he talks about his own experience with atrial fibrillation as a runner. And so, of course, he explains his bias around writing this paper. Uh, but what this paper did is start a very important dialogue. And one of the things I've learned as I've gone along this journey is that for the most part, where there's lots of smoke, there's usually a, a little bit of fire, which means even though things get very much blown up, there's usually a reason why we start talking about them. So I think, and this has been the last 10 years of the, the, the world of sports cardiology, is that we have to ask the question, does too much exercise over too much time hurt your heart? And I would say, importantly, if so, affect both morbidity and mortality? And if so, what does this pathology look like? So why talk about this? It's not just the Wall Street Journal. We need to talk about this because there is some science which questions the, con the concept of high-level exercise being good for you. The first is that there are some epidemiologic data which now show that at a certain level of exercise, you, go, you get no more return for your investment, meaning you're not going to get better by exercising more. There are lots of anecdotal observations of physically fit people dying while they exercise. And the question is, why are they dying? Is it some problem that was caused by the sport? And the third is there's a whole literature now, observational data looking at particularly imaging sets of athletes which show pathology where you wouldn't expect it. And so perhaps if all of these come together, there may be some syndrome of cardiovascular abnormalities that are caused by chronic exposure to lots of sport. So to start thinking about this concept, I want to just take you back to the fundamental principle of dose response. When we think about dose response, this is when we give someone some medicine or we expose someone to some stimulus, we define their response by two curves, an efficacy curve and a toxicity curve. And what we hope, for example, when we give a patient a medication is that we're going to find the margin of safety where they experience efficacy and avoid toxicity. However, this is tricky because when we start applying this not to populations, but to individuals, we realize there are outliers. There are benefit outliers. So people that get lots of benefit despite very low doses and people that get no benefit despite very high doses. And there are toxicity outliers, people that develop reactions at very low doses and people that can withstand exceptionally high doses of some stimulus. With respect to exercise and the concept of how much dose should we get, it gets even trickier because it really depends on what outcome you're talking about. So these are four examples. Curve A, a linear curve, is a good curve to explain the relationship between exercise dose and race performance. The harder you train up to a very high level, typically the faster you run or swim or cycle. Curve B is a good explanation of the relationship between exercise an improvement of cardiovascular risk factors like high blood pressure or cholesterol. If you go from doing nothing to something, you get an, a return on that. But at a certain point, more exercise is not going to lower your blood pressure more. It's not going to improve your cholesterol more. It's not going to help your diabetes more. So there's an asymptote to that curve. The one on your lower right is, I think, actually scientifically the most interesting, and that's the relationship between exercise dose and weight loss. If you go from doing nothing to something, you will stimulate some weight loss but it actually takes a lot of exercise to lose weight and to keep it off, typically two to three times physical activity recommendations, which as most of you know or should know, are 150 minutes of moderate activity a week or 75 minutes of vigorous activity a week. That's what we should be telling our patients. and That's what we should be doing for ourselves. And then, of course, for those of you that are athletes in the room or on the Zoom, you'll recognize the, uh, the bell-shaped curve is the relationship between exercise, dose, and marital success. If you're not home on the weekends, your spouse is not going to be happy with you. So when people ask me, how much exercise should I get? The question really is, what are you using exercise for? And that's the starting point of the discussion.
So what do we know about athletes and how well they do? Um, these are data, these are old data, about 30 years old from Finland, but they're still the best we have. This is looking at Finnish elite athletes that participated in, in sports, team sports or power sports, and following them over the course of their lifespan. And what you can see here is that about the fourth or fifth decade, there's curve separation, meaning these athletes did differently than sedentary referent controls. And here are the numbers that come from this study. So on average, endurance sport athletes lived about five to six years longer than reference. Team sport athletes got on average two to three years longer. And power sport athletes, so men and women that lift weights or throw heavy things, actually enjoyed no mortality benefit. And that's a fascinating thing, why weightlifting might not help you live longer. We'll talk more about that if you're interested. It's not just how long you live, but it's how much you use the medical system. And this is a, another Finnish paper, which uh, was very informative. What this paper looked at is the relationship between your athletic background and how sick you got when you got older. And I've just because I'm a cardiologist, I've highlighted the one I'm most interested in, which is ischemic heart disease. And you can see here that the endurance sport athletes and the team sport athletes had a much lower incidence of coronary disease when they got low, when they got older, whereas the power sport athletes, interestingly, had more coronary disease. So an interesting twist, but the take home here is that endurance sports are protective against most forms of disease. Um, wrapping this up in terms of what we think we know about exercise and longevity is our friend Charles Darwin. Right? We all know who Darwin is and what he taught us. Darwin's most important lesson was survival of the fittest. And indeed, we have data to now show in the contemporary medical setting that Darwin was right. These are data from the Veterans Hospital in Stanford, California, in which they looked at a huge number of men over many years who went through exercise testing. And what you can see here is that the better your exercise capacity, you're measured in NETS, which is the acronym for metabolic equivalence the less likely you were to die. And what's interesting here is that they showed that this was not just true for healthy men, but also for men with established heart disease, hypertension, arrhythmias, coronary disease. The better you do on the treadmill, the longer you live. So this is a survival of the fittest through the eyes of the doctor. It's more complicated though. So far, this has been a good news story, but this is where things get interesting. And this is why I do the job I do. Um, this is a study that we did in my old hometown of Boston. This was a, um, a complex survey-based study in which we engaged about 800 men and women from our local catchment area who were master's athletes. These are men and women that train for triathlon, for rowing events, for marathons. And we asked them lots and lots of questions, and we learned a lot. So just the take-homes. The first is that these men and women go to the doctor's office, and when they do so, the doctors do lots of tests. They screen them with ECGs, with exercise stress tests with echoes and increasingly with CT scans. And the doctors are doing this for good reason, because if you look, many of these men and women have risk factors for heart disease, a family history of early heart disease, prior tobacco use, high blood pressure, bad cholesterol. And it turns out as a, as a distribution in this pie chart, only about a quarter of the healthiest people in our community, these are the master's athletes that look the healthiest, were risk factor free, whereas most of them had one, two, or more risk factors, and about 10% of them already had a heart problem. But I think the two most important things that came out of this is that we learned that when these people go to the doctor, they feel dismissed or mistreated because the doctor doesn't understand their desires as an athlete. The doctor looks at them and says, you're the healthiest person I've seen all day. You can run 10 kilometers. You don't need me. See you soon. Whereas these people have come to the doctor for a reason, and they know that they have something going on and they want to be taken seriously. And the conversation that they want to have with their doctor is about this exercise dose question. And so one of the main reasons why they felt mistreated or dismissed is that the clinicians were under-equipped to talk about appropriate exercise dose. I Meaning these people wanted to come to the doctor and ask about the appropriateness of doing one versus two versus three marathons a year, one versus two versus three Ironman a year. And the doctors rolled their eyes back on their head and said, I have no idea what you're talking about. Not only that, but I have no idea how to measure what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So this brings me to my first tech opportunity for you guys to think about. We need in the clinical world and in the exercise world, better tools to measure exercise dose and physical activity. We need to move away from the old school daily journal or daily workout list into what we're now doing both in the science world as an example using actigraphs or accelerometers to measure population activity or the user interface using things like commercially available watches with GPSs 
But where we're missing and where we really need the tech community to help us is to link this stuff to the medical record so that we can understand the relationship between what men and women do over many years and why they end up coming into us sick. So tech opportunity one is linking existing data capture devices with medical interface so we can think about how to understand the relationship between exercise dose and both good outcomes and bad outcomes. All right, let's go back to Ted and get more personal. When Ted comes to me every year, which she's done for many years, he comes over to Switzerland now, um, he asked me the four same questions. Not only does he ask the questions, but his wife asks the questions. She comes with them every time. For those of you that take care of patients, when a wife or a husband comes with that their person to the doctor, they're more important than the patient. Because if you don't answer their questions, they're not gonna leave happy. So the questions that Ted and his wife ask me every time they come are the following. They wanna understand causality. They wanna know, did all this sport that Ted do cause his arrhythmia? Could it cause a heart problem? Could it cause a big aorta? And could it cause coronary disease? Because we're all taught that exercise protects against all of these things. So where is the truth? Where is the sweet spot? And I will tell you that the answer to each of these as I'll walk through is going to be different. But with each of these, there are unanswered questions where tech and imaging is going to play a major role. So sit tight and think as you're hearing this about how you can contribute. So this is classic day for me. This is a 52-year-old marathon runner who comes in with reduced exercise tolerance. He just simply can't run as fast as he used to. For those of you that are familiar with the electrocardiograms, this is not a diagnostic challenge. This is something called atrial fibrillation, in which the atrium and the ventricles are electrically disconnected, and you can see that there's irregularity in the heart rate. This is the single most common arrhythmia in aging athletes. There now have been lots and lots and lots of observational studies that have all reached the same conclusion, and that is that men particularly, this is a more male-dominated problem, but both men and women who exercise hard into the second half of life are at increased risk of atrial fibrillation. There's no doubt about this anymore. This is the best example we have of what we would call overuse pathology, meaning pushing too hard and having a problem that directly results from it. Best example of this, in my mind, comes from Sweden. And this is a study in which participants in the Vasa Lopit, which for those of you that do some ski to fall, you'll recognize this race. It's a 90-kilometer ski race held, held every year in, Sw in Sweden. And what's been nice about this is that the Swedish investigators have been able to look at participants over a 10-year period of time and track their medical outcomes. And what they did, which was very clever, is they looked at how fast these men and women skied the race, which is race time, and how many races they did over the course of a decade. And these are surrogates for exercise intensity and exercise volume. And in both cases, the faster these athletes skied, and the more races they skied, the more likely they were to go on to develop arrhythmia, right? And this arrhythmia was almost all atrial fibrillation. So this is a classic example of how the right study comes up with the most clinically relevant question. Now, the, the real issue is not whether this happens, but why it happens. The classic explanation is that athletes get atrial fibrillation because their heart gets bigger. And we know from the heart failure world that when the left atrium enlarges, that's a risk factor for congestive heart failure and atrial fibrillation. But that's not a satisfying answer because we know that for the most part, heart enlargement in athletes is a healthy thing, not, a, not an unhealthy thing. And it turns out there's a long list of things that probably, and I say probably because some of this is still not clear, that probably go into the development of atrial fibrillation. It's probably less about dilation and more about fibrotic remodeling of the atrium. We know that there are important changes in the autonomic nervous system. There are blood pressure fluctuations during exercise, inflammation, genetics, and then some very important lifestyle factors like excessive alcohol consumption, which is a major issue among master's athletes. People love to run hard and drink hard. And if you don't ask them about that, you won't worry about it. And of course, caffeine and psychosocial stress. So I want to just use atrial fibrillation as what I think is the strongest example between endurance sport and pathology. There is no more question left that the harder we push, the older we get, the more likely we are to develop fibrillation. I'm still not certain in my own mind how much of this is the sport itself or the lifestyle choices that come along with sport, but this association is now clear. The problem is that we don't fully understand how to predict who's at risk, and even worse is we don't understand how to treat them. So for those of you that are clinically oriented, either here or on the Zoom, I'm going to just walk you through why I say this. So atrial fibrillation in older people that are not athletes is easy, right? 
And when I present this to a group of cardiologists, they say this guy from previously from Boston, now from Switzerland is crazy. We've known how to take care of atrial fibrillation for years. It's simple. We can either decide to keep them in sinus rhythm or allow them to stay in atrial fibrillation. That's what we call rate control versus rhythm control. And rhythm control versus rate control are equivalent in non-athletic people. But if you put someone on a medication just to keep their heart rate low, they're going to come back to you and tell them that you've ruined their life. So we don't understand this issue in athletes. The second is how to predict in athletes who's going to have a stroke and who's going to bleed. Because importantly, we put a lot of our atrial fibrillation patients on blood thinners. And these scores are very useful. But if you would try to apply this score to the population I'm talking about, you're going to have people ask where these scores really made for people like me. And the answer was no. And then finally, as most of you know, the, the most exciting advance in the treatment of atrial fibrillation over the last 15, 20 years has been the use of catheter ablation, which is where the doctor goes into the heart, burns the inside of the heart, stops the atrial fibrillation, and cures the patient. Now, this is quite effective, and there's a role for it in the care of athletes. But what we're learning is that this may not be as useful in high-end athletes as it is in the general population. And that's based on the observation that people come back and they say they're cured of their arrhythmia but they're not fixed as an athlete. And this has to do with what happens to the heart when it's burned. The arrhythmia goes away, but its ability to contract and dilate also goes away. So they're left with a normal rhythm, but they can't exercise. And so this is a big problem. This is tech opportunity too. What I care about and what most doctors in the trenches care about is coming up with tools to understand this myocardial physiology. What I mean by that is to move beyond the concept of simply using echo or MR to look at atrial size and structure, to push further into function, but ultimately to understand these four structures here intimately, which are lost in the imaging world. These are your inferior and superior pulmonary veins, and that's where atrial fibrillation comes from. So what we need are imaging-based techniques to better resolve pulmonary vein physiology not when someone's lying in an MR scanner or not when someone's lying on a catheter table, but when they're doing this, because it's the combination of a problem here and this stress, which leads to this. And in 2023, I have no good tools to predict with that which athletes are going to get this and which are not. Next thing, cardiomyopathy. So this is heart muscle problems. This is a really interesting story. Um, for many years, we had a program in Boston called the Harvard Athlete Initiative. This was an opportunity to work with our undergraduate athletes, many of which were national team caliber, rowers, runners, cyclists. And we did lots of studies looking at how the heart changes with exercise. And one of the very first studies we did simply because it was an exciting evolving technique at that time was to use strain echocardiography to look at how exercise training affects the way the heart contracts. So I suspect most of you are familiar with what strain is. It's simply looking at deformation of the heart muscle and the three principal vectors and when you apply strain by echo or MR, and some people even use CT now, you can develop what are called strain maps in which you look at changes in strain in the three principal vectors, longitudinal, radial, and circumferential. And what was interesting in this group of athletes that went through 90 days of intense training is that their strain increased, meaning their contractile strength increased in all segments of the heart with one exception. And that is here in the interventricular septum we saw a consistent reduction in strength, meaning the heart looked like it was getting tired. And this was something that at that point, we had no idea what to do with. We wrote this paper, published it, and in the discussion, we had two sentences saying, we're not sure if there's any relevance. Maybe there will be someday. Two or three years later, um, as we were thinking about the follow-up to this, we remembered that the left ventricle is not the only side of the heart. There's a right ventricle. And what we saw is that the men who had the higher disc looking septums were also the men whose right ventricles got the biggest. So something about what was happening on the right side of the heart was affecting the left side of the heart. And this was the first, I think, in the sports world, evidence of interventricular dependence. Um, but from a kind of a contextual perspective, this still didn't really have a home until I got a call from a, a British guy by the name of Greg White, who had done a small MR series in Masters Athletes and had noted that there were there was evidence of fibrosis by late GAD imaging. And this fibrosis tended to be located right in the place where we saw the septal fatigue. So Greg's question to me was, do you think that those fatigue signals you saw in the young, healthy people could over time lead to scarring in older people? And my answer to him was, I sure hope not, but it's a great hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And 
This was followed by probably one of the most influential studies that's come out over the last 15, 20 years in this field, done by my good friend Andre Le Gersh, who's an Australian who was doing his postdoc up in, in Belgium at Louvain at the time. And what I want to do is walk you through his study. So what Andre did is he looked at endurance athletes that were very accomplished and very competitive, and he looked at them in a very clever way. These were the men and women. They were marathon runners, endurance triathletes, cyclists, ultra distance runners. And what I'll call your attention to, and you should always look at this when you look at studies of athletes, is just how fit these people were. So third line from the bottom, percent predicted VO2 max, 146, 142, 141, 154, 148. This means that these men and women were 50% more fit than their sedentary reference of their age. So these are truly a very high level competitors. So we studied the right people. What he did is he took measurements of them at baseline right after a big race and then about a week or two after. And he did lots of different things, blood measurements, echo measurements, MRI measurements, and he asked lots of different questions. And the major finding from Andre's work is that when we push our bodies hard in endurance sport, the right ventricle is the weak link. The right ventricle is the chamber that gets tired. And the right ventricle is the chamber that when it gets tired, affects the rest of the heart. Here's the schematic that came out of this paper, and it's quite useful. And what you can see here is that going from baseline to immediate post-race, there's fatigue and dilation of the right ventricle. And what that does is it pushes the septum to the left with a reduction in left ventricular volumes. And over time, over many years, this septal stress probably causes problems. And indeed, in 40 people in Andre's study, <clears throat> Five and the 40 of them had these MRs, in which you see evidence of late GAD in the septum, or more importantly, in the RV insertion hinge point where the right ventricle and the left ventricle come together. And so this was a very provocative finding. Now, the study is now 12 years old, and we do hundreds of thousands of MRs and athletes, and we see this relatively infrequently, but it does exist, and you need to be aware of it. The question is, why does it happen? So it's not just sport. I want to impress that upon you. It requires a lot of sport, but there's probably a whole long list of other things. One is not getting enough rest and recovery. So this is training too hard and not resting. The second is that there's probably something at the level of the host susceptibility genetically. It's not ARBC genes. Those have been looked at. It's something else that we don't understand. But probably more importantly, there's always some secondary process. Drug use, occult infection, so subclinical myocarditis or maybe something as simple as hypertension. And indeed, if all of these things line up, you can end up with a heart like this, but this is very much something that we're still learning about and not something we see a lot clinically. So these are preliminary, but the idea is that if you superimpose lots of sport with all of these other bad things, you probably can develop left ventricular and right ventricular fibrosis. But at this point, we really don't know what to do with this in clinic. But I will tell you again, this is another tech opportunity because we see fibrosis all the time. And the simple use of pattern recognition to differentiate benign fibrosis from maladaptive or risky fibrosis is not enough. I cannot look at an MR and tell you based on the pattern of fibrosis, who's susceptible to arrhythmias and who's not, who's susceptible to sudden death and who's not. So what we need to do is we need to push the imaging community to come together with the clinical community to think about how we can take images and better risk stratify the people we should tell to sit down and stop exercising from those that we can say, go forth and prosper and keep pushing. All right, the aorta. So you're all familiar with the aorta. You look at thoracic imaging all the time. You know that the aorta is typically less than four centimeters in a, an adult male, less than 3.4 centimeters in an adult female. And the reason we worry about big aortas is that in the right context, Aortic aneurysms can, over time, develop acute aortic syndromes like this one, which is a classic example of a proximal ascending dilation. Uh, you can see the dissection flap here sitting in the middle of the proximal ascending aorta, probably false lumen, true lumen, but you can't be sure unless you have cine images. But this kills people, right? 50% mortality when you dissect. If you're not in the hospital within six hours, your mortality goes up to 80%. So big aortas are scary. We simply don't like them because we worry about this. In the sports world, the teaching over many years has been that sports has no impact on the aorta, that you can do lots and lots of exercise and the aorta doesn't change size or shape. Good news, right? Because we don't want dissections in young athletes. But the challenge is that all of these data have come from people like this, 25 years old, 23 years old. <laughs> and so this is a very much a reassuring early life story. Um, but 
It's not the whole story. Um, and we also know that on the big end of things, the people that tend to have the biggest aortas are the tallest people. So there's a scaling relationship between how tall you are and how big your aorta is. <laughs> so, right, Rude is saying over there. It's a little big, it's okay, don't worry. <laughs> but the, the, the important thing here is that we, for many years, have thought that sport doesn't affect the aorta. Um, we had seen over many years through our clinical observations a lot of aortic dilation in older athletes but it had never really been studied well. So one of my colleagues, one of my postdocs at the time, Tim Churchill, did a really nice study in which we recruited exceptionally high-level master's athletes. So these were qualifiers for the Boston Marathon, sub-310 for men, sub-330 for women, and national-level rowers who were participating in either national or international regattas. And we got them to come to Boston and do, and some in California, to do an echo study, simply to ask the question, what do we see when we look at the aorta? And these are older men and women. So in their late 50s, early 60s, they had well-developed medical histories. Some of them had pre-existing problems, but these are your typical master's athletes. But importantly, these men and women had trained competitively for a long time, 26, 24, 20, 22 years. They did these were people that were pushing the envelope. And what was interesting is that when we looked at the distribution of aortic size, both at the sinus of Alsalva as well as in the true ascending proximal portion, we saw a bell-shaped or a Gaussian distribution, but a significant side of that rightward tail was well above the clinical cut point for normality, right? So what we're seeing here is that many of these men and women have aortas that are bigger than what doctors would typically be comfortable with. And this was an incredibly important, but also a very provocative finding because we don't know what to do with this. On one side, this could be challenging the paradigm that sport doesn't affect the aorta. And maybe we're seeing a lifelong sport just simply causes the aorta to get a little bigger and who cares? Or maybe sport affects the aorta and actually increases men and women's risk of having an acute aortic syndrome like dissection. Stay tuned. We have this, these people now in an ongoing longitudinal database. I can tell you we're six years out from the initial time point now. We have 96% capture and repeat imaging on these people. And we haven't seen any significant progression in not one single aortic syndrome. So it's looking like, and again, we need to finish the whole 10 years, but it's looking like we're going to be able to add the aorta, at least in some cases, to the list of things that we consider adaptive in older athletes, but we're going to still have a big question on our hands, and that's where the next tech opportunity comes from. At present, we have no tools to differentiate good big from bad big, and this is really important because if I find an athlete with a clear pathologic aorta, I'm going to take them out of high-level sports because I don't want to risk a dissection. If, on the other hand, I'm convinced that they, that aorta is just mildly dilated simply because of their lifetime of sports, I'm going to tell them to keep pushing. We need functional imaging, right? And this is imaging that looks at things like your, the sensibility, hemodynamics, aortaventricular coupling, things that are going to help us understand how to differentiate the good big from the bad big. So if ever anyone's interested in aortic imaging, please come talk to me because this is a field that's going to explode in this patient population over the next couple of years. All right, finally, to wrap up here in the last 10 minutes, coronary disease. Um, whenever I talk to doctors about coronary disease in athletes, they say, why are we talking about this? Because we know that exercise is good for you. It reduces your blood pressure, it improves your cholesterol, it gets rid of fat in the wrong places. And importantly, even when we ask the question, how does exercise do this? We only know about 50%. Exercise is just so good for you that it should melt away coronary heart disease. Um, turns out that that's not the case. Um, this was another provocative study. This is published in the European Heart Journal now 15 years ago, uh, German investigators, in which they looked at men who participated in multiple marathons, and they compared them to age match controls and age match controls that were also matched for traditional risk factors. And they did one single simple measurement, and that's a coronary artery calcium score. And lo and behold, what they found is that the marathon runners had more coronary calcium than the non-marathon runners. Not only that, but the men that had the highest calcium levels went on to have problems. So at least in this population, this wasn't simply a benign marker. This was something that predicted risk of future events. Let's take a quick look at who these four men were, though. Um, runner one, who had done 14 marathons, went on to have ventricular tachycardia and needed a stent. But he also had a total cholesterol of 344 and was a former smoker. Runner two was a 22-year marathon veteran who needed a stent and a bypass operation, but he had a history of hypertension. 
that was treated. Runners three and four had untreated hypertension and were former smokers and had remarkably run 65 and 140 marathons, but they went on to have coronary interventions. So the big question from this study was, what are we seeing? Are we seeing coronary calcium develop because of running? Or are we seeing people coming to running with risk factors that run despite those risk factors and have coronary calcium unrelated to the room? We all know that coronary calcification is by itself means nothing. It's a nonspecific marker of injury and repair. But the reason we worry about this in the general clinical population is that the burden of coronary calcification tends to track with what we care about, and that's the presence of lipid-rich plaques, which cause problems like myocardial infarction. And indeed, there are lots of good epidemiologic studies from the general population. This, these are data from the Framingham Heart Study, uh, but there are plenty of other European populations to choose from in which the more calcium you have, the more likely you are to go on and have some sort of bad event. Fast forward just a couple of years ago, two tandem papers came out in circulation at the same time, one from the UK group and one from, uh, from, from the Netherlands. And they both asked the same question. That is, if we not like the Germans did study people that smoked and had high blood pressure and ran marathons, but if we truly study people that exercise that have no risk factors, what do we find? And the answer is both of the studies found the same thing. And that is that the lifelong exercisers, the people that did exercise for many years, tended to have more coronary calcification than the non-exercisers. And so this was very much a wake-up call that perhaps coronary calcification is a consequence of exercise, and perhaps that comes with bad outcomes. But there were no outcomes in this study. This was an observational imaging data set. So why does this happen? Uh, what, what I want to impress upon you, and this is where we're going to get to our final tech opportunity, is that not all calcium is created equal. This is Clarence DeMar. Clarence DeMar was one of the greatest marathon, uh, marathoners in the world. He ran Boston and won many, many times. And when he died, he gave his body to medicine for an autopsy. And his autopsy specimens are actually still stored in my old workplace, the Mass General Hospital. And so I've gone and looked at his coronaries. His left anterior descending coronary artery measures about eight millimeters. There's not a single speck of cholesterol in it at all, but he's got this beautiful salt and pepper calcification around the greater curvature. So what this is, this is benign adaptive calcification caused by many years of high blood flow in which there was shear stress, the artery re remodeled, repaired. He didn't die from coronary disease, he died from cancer, and he died at an old age. So this is totally benign. On the other end of the spectrum, you have this guy who's, uh, whose name is, was Ed Walsh, who's a patient of mine, who ended up having a bypass surgery in his early 50s, was not a healthy guy, but found exercise and pushed very hard for many years. But in doing so, he forgot about the importance of taking care of his blood pressure and cholesterol. And when he died, his autopsy showed not that, but this really diseased lipid rich arteries that cause people to have sudden cardiac death and myocardial infarction. So we have this spectrum of calcification. On one end, we have a benign phenotype that's probably caused by a lot of exercise. On the other end, we have a much more lethal phenotype that exists not because of exercise, but along with exercise. And right now, clinically, we don't do a very good job differentiating this. So this is the final tech opportunity. And that is, we need to move from calcium scoring and even from basic CT angiography to better tools to take a proximal left coronary system that looks like this and be able to tell the doctors, is this going to happen, which is a left anterior descending MI? Or is this going to happen? That this calcium is going to sit there for years and years, and these men and women are going to go on to do everything they want without any problems. Right now, we have no tools for that. Coronary imaging is structure. We need to move from structure to function to outcomes to better answer these questions. So just to put this all together to remind you, the most important thing from the talk is that the vast majority of recreational competitive athletes are going to live in this margin of safety. They're going to get all the benefits. They're going to feel better. They're going to sleep better. They're going to think better. They're going to have better sex. They're going to eat better. All the things that come along with staying fit and no problems. Coronary disease is a problem among athletes, but my synthesis of the literature is it has nothing to do with how much exercise they do. It's the risk factors they bring to life, the blood pressure they forget about, the cholesterol they won't treat, the cigarettes they cheat on the weekend. That's the problem. In contrast, atrial fibrillation is an example of overuse pathology. This condition is one that we now know, without a shred of doubt, is more likely to occur if you stay very fit as you get older. And as I said, our challenges now are figuring out from a data-based perspective how to treat and how to understand who's at risk. Aortic dilation, stay tuned. I think we're going to end, end up adding this to the list of benign adaptations, but we need the clinical outcomes to make that. And then this issue of toxic exposure hurting the heart. 
Um, there's some concern about it, but in my perspective, the concern hasn't really borne out, so I wouldn't think too much about it. Finally, um, I just want to make one plea, and that is that no matter what area of imaging or medicine or science you work in, please remember that you need to be thinking about the impact of physical activity on whatever outcome you're measuring. And that is because every single one of us, every single healthy person, every single patient that comes to the doctor belongs in one of three categories. People that don't get enough exercise, the red box. People that do everything right, 150 minutes or 75 minutes. Those are few and far between. And then increasingly people that push really hard and exceed any sort of guideline. And what we really don't know, particularly on this side, is what the risks and benefits of lots and lots of exercise over many years are. And importantly, as we're developing technology to answer, hopefully answer some of the questions I've raised today, we need to be thinking about the specifics of studying this population because we can and will develop technology in a different way for them than we will for people that are sick in the hospital. Boston Marathon finish line, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron, for sharing these stimulating thoughts with us. And uh, it's just just amazing, you know, what you put together here and what you were able to share with us to, to provide us with so much insight and, and interesting questions, I'm sure. So people in the room or also people in online, uh, please feel free to ask questions. Ruth? Uh, yeah, th that was an amazing talk. Uh, still a bit of information overload. But um, my main question, the one thing I didn't see is how does diet play into all of this? Because that's the, all, the other thing you always hear about. You do more exercise and eat more healthy. So how did that play in there? Is it not relevant in top athletes because they all diet correctly and so on? It's such a good question. So let me answer in the reverse order. It's absolutely relevant. There is this concept among elite athletes that the furnace burns hot, so you can put whatever you want into it, meaning they can eat whatever they want and stay thin and slender and muscular. But we know without a shred of doubt that macronutrient choices dictate every heart outcome known to man. So it's very important. Why did I not talk about it? Because it's really easy to forget about the things that we don't measure well. None of the studies I've showed you, none of the studies to date have done a good job characterizing dietary intake because it's simply such a hard thing to measure accurately. Even in the dietary science literature, the, val the validity of a two-week questionnaire or a randomized diet is pretty shabby. So while it's one of the missing pieces, we just don't have any data. Yes. Uh, thanks for the talk, it was really nice. Um, so I'm a neuroscientist myself, and um, I have loads of friends that actually scan muscles in athletes. Mm -hmm. And uh, during your talk, I was wondering if we should maybe actually bring all these disciplines together and look at the bigger picture rather than just in our disciplines, really look at the details and then forget about the rest of the body. Because in the end, the whole body is exercising together, right? What do you think about that? Why <laughs> I mean, the concept of cross-disciplinary work is really the next frontier. So I think, and I have thought in my career a lot about myocardiobiology, but it turns out that scale of a muscle, which people thought for many years was a new tissue that sat there and did nothing, is as important as a signaling tissue than probably as the brain, at least during exercise. So the concept of bringing people from different skill sets together to ask bigger questions, and I would love to talk to you more after about that, is really what the future looks like. It's, we're done being neuroscientists, cardiologists, basic muscle physiologists. We don't get together in the same room. We're not going to move the needle. Yeah. Other questions? I hope, I hope I didn't scare anyone away from exercise. <laughs> Bottom line is it's still good. More is better. I have a question for you. Um, you know, what you see here in athletes, and of course you look very carefully at them because those are your patients, mm -hmm. isn't this just putting under the magnifying glass what exists in the general population and it's just more visible because they come to your office? Sure. I mean, so sports cardiology is, is inevitably the application of general cardiology principles to a specific population. But there are differences. So the athletes may develop the same diseases. And atrial fibrillation is a good example. But the treatment strategies, which have been derived from general population work, simply don't easily apply. So for me to give you, who goes out and runs hard and is an athletic guy, a blood thinner is a very, very different risk calculus than if you were at home sitting on the couch watching TV. And 
all of the decisions we make that are based on studies from sick old people, which is where most of this has been done, have a lot of limitations. So yes, it's turning the magnifying lens on a healthy population, but our approach is very, has to be very different. Well, combining the question of Ruth with uh, what you said, um, looking at the different athletes with different risk profiles, I think I remember the uh, the weightlifters and perhaps the runners and the rowers, which have look look like they have a different spectrum of of diseases or may yeah. live live less long, as it were. Now, I was wondering how how are performance enhancing drugs playing into this? Uh, I mean, this must be under the radar, uh, but a lot of them must be doing it. So, does this have an impact? How long do we have? <laughs> so, I could spend the next two hours talking about the importance of, of performance enhancing drugs. Probably most relevant to Matthias's question is the use of androgenic anabolic steroids, so drugs that make men and women muscles get bigger. Um, they rip the heart apart. So you can go through a long list of mechanisms. They cause hypertension. They reduce good cholesterol. They cause heart fibrosis. They cause coronary placking. So having used steroids for more than two years is now, in my mind, an independent risk factor for coronary artery disease. And one of the reasons why the power athletes, particularly when they were studied in the 60s and 70s, didn't do as well is that steroid use was rampant at the elite levels of sport then. Now it's gotten better, but it's by no means gone. And what's even more concerning is steroid use is no longer a problem confined just to elite athletes. This stuff exists here in our community and normal men who simply go to the gym to lift weights and get bigger. I can, after this, shut my presentation down, go onto the internet and order testosterone propionate and have it shipped to my home in Orange within 48 hours. It's that easy. Not only that, but I can go to the payout and buy a book called The Ultimate Steroid, Steroid Hand Guide. And in that book, I will get instructions. This is available. If you can go to the Lausanne payout and buy this, this book will tell me everything I need to know to use steroids successfully. So probably 10% of the male population will use steroids at one, person, at one time, and about half of them will develop a dependency syndrome. So whenever we study athletes, we have to be very clear to understand their history of that and to control for that. Because if not, what are we doing? We're doing a drug study, not an athlete study. But that'd be the same thing. But that's a good story. <laughs> you also talked about uh, healthy doses or unhealthy doses of exercise. And I think ramping up an effort, if you want to start doing it, is also something that has, has to be done carefully. Yeah. But, you know, when I'm looking at the devices and the apps, they are giving us uh, like Strava, like, like Garmin, etc. This, this actually motivates you to do more, to do faster, to do longer, to do heavier, to do, you know, whatever. And I don't think that's the right thing. So why are these tools not, you know, thinking more carefully and they could, right? Yeah, because they only have one goal, and that's to sell more product. Right, because if you train for your first marathon using that and you have a good first marathon, you're going to use it for the rest of your life and you're going to keep pushing despite how injured you get, despite how much coronary disease you get, despite your blood pressure. So one of the things that I've been working, particularly with Strava on this issue, is to help them think about their messaging as it relates not only to performance in an event six weeks from now, but also performance 20 years from now and 20 years from now. It's a difficult conversation to have because they don't want things popping up to remind people that there are potential health things they should think about. It's not a very sexy message, but it's a responsible message. And so I hope, and that's where when we went back to that slide about exercise dose getting into the medical record, Strava, Garmin, Sunto, all of these trackers now have the data that we need to answer the question, many of the questions I was bringing up today. But until they get on board with this, and understand that they have a community responsibility, which is how I see it. It's locked away in a, behind a firewall. Great. Yeah, that brings you also to my favorite part of exercise, rest. Um, so <laughs> there is the, always now, the Garmin has this recommendation of, oh, you did the, this cycling, of what I personally do, uh, take off 72 <laughs> hours now. Is that actually uh, science-based? Is that evidence-based, that kind of thing? Or is that just uh, like a ballpark thing that uh, these devices now give? Because that kind of 
plays into that indeed. Uh, like, hey, he says I can do nothing for today, so I do nothing yeah, today. It depends on how you define science. So the recommendations are algorithm based, meaning they impute your physiologic variables and try to decide what's best for someone like you, but they're not linked to any outcome. So for instance, that rest period in you has never been linked to actually coming back doing better or recovering better, nor is that rest period for you going to be the same for that rest period for me. So I, I love my garment, right? I wear this thing. I train every day, but I don't listen to a word of advice from it because it almost invariably tells you the wrong stuff and why take bad advice. Sure. Yeah, I get the sort of ending. So that's not, not outcome driven. And is it like population average based and so on? Or? Yeah. So what they're continually doing, for, particularly for people, and Garmin's a good example, the download at the Garmin Connect, mm -hmm. is they're taking the data that gets uploaded and they're continually adding to their database so that they have population-based norms. Mm -hmm. And so from a population perspective, there, there are some useful things that come out of that. But it goes back to that slide I was showing you with the outliers. Many of us are outliers. We recover more quickly, less quickly. We get injured with more or less. And so until you have a sense of who you are, uh, and many of us are outliers, these watches don't help. They don't want to hear me say that, but that's the truth. And the worst is the Apple Watch. <laughs> you want to use a watch to exercise and stay healthy, <laughs> buy something else. If you want to play games and text your friends and email, Apple Watch is great. But it wasn't designed as an exercise or health tool, and that's how they're trying to market it now, which is simply garbage. I moved this from the recording. <laughs> 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 but there always. That's you have a question. Just, just one. It's just basically what I got from all the information you gave us is that it's very personalized. You need personalized uh, diagnosis to have an idea of what impact um, extreme exercise or just maybe for a normal person, uh, 75 uh, minutes per week can be extreme, mm -hmm. depending on your lifetime. Mm -hmm. So you need uh, personalized uh, information basically to, uh, to foresee what could happen if every week you do this amount of exercise. So, so basically, this kind of watch, they just use PPG to give us whatever HR with such a precision. So what would be necessary would be what exactly? Because we can measure, for example, when I start to have blood pressure with these kind of uh, mm -hmm. technologies, we see that they have these uh, one lead ECGs that you can keep during the running. Mm -hmm. So would it be enough as information for longitudinal information, for example, every time you go to run or for all the time now, some, some people, they just wear it during the night mm -hmm. also. But would it be enough uh, to pre-screen or to at least not prevent, but you know if we go too far in our daily exercise, not being an extreme, you know, at least just, yeah. you know, drinking, smoking, and doing your 10 kilometers per week, yeah. is it too much? Or And would be enough, basically, just with this kind of information, without any imaging? So let me try to answer the question in two ways. One is that um, there probably is enough information in your watch for you to understand your changes over time today without any manipulation. So understanding resting heart rate trends, understanding heart rate variability, those are useful ways based on science to understand how you're progressing, getting enough recovery. The major issue, though, is if we take 100 people like you that have the same lifestyle, do the same amount of exercise, and I want to ask, how does that information help us predict who's going to stay healthy and who's going to get sick? We no longer can do that. If you came to my office with a heart problem and I looked at your data and saw you were doing a lot of exercise, it would be tempting for me to think that the exercise caused that heart problem. But you may very well be one of a thousand people that did just the same amount of exercise and the only one with that heart problem. So until we're able, and that was the point of that slide, to link the, the useful information you're getting from your watch to a medical record so that I can understand how a thousand people like you fare over many years. I can't base recommendations on that alone. Mm -hmm. We need data. We need data. We need, and we need people that understand the big data side of it, but also people that understand the clinical outcome side of it. We can bring them together and be able to answer the question. The million dollar question you just asked is how can I take that information and make responsible decisions for myself? I have one final question. 
And that is, you know, all these data that are now being collected by all these tools, be it Strava, be it or whatever. Um, I think that we, we will find a lot of associations in the data, right? But we will not necessarily understand cause and effect. And I think this is a very interesting topic to go into to, to gain really more knowledge uh, yeah. based out of these data. Are these data publicly available or how, how does this work? No. So all of the data are proprietary. When you buy a watch and you go on to the software and connect your watch to the software, whether you realize it or not, you are giving your data to those companies to be able to be used in a de-identified fashion. But those companies to date, for the most part, have not partnered with scientists to use that information. Now we're trying to change that. The reason they want it is to improve the quality of their products so they can find out how they're going to sell more watches. The reason we want it is to do exactly what Matias suggested, is to look longitudinally over time, to look at trends and changes, because longitudinal data allows you to establish cause and effect relationships. Cross-sectional data generates hypotheses, longitudinal data, cause and effect. So the data actually exists. It's just a matter of being able to get the right people in the right room together to figure out how to merge it and ask the right questions. All right, great. Thanks, okay. guys. Is there a yeah, question just, online? Uh, one second. Okay. Um, you know, there are no questions online, but at this point, uh, I'd like to uh, thank the speaker and the host. Oh, so, talking to our appreciate you so much. And uh, I wonder what that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, respective. And, and, uh, there's also um, a um, sharing session just before the croissants. So uh, thank you once again, well, and I will just share a few updates and allow you to share a few updates if you like. So thank you once again. Great. Thank you. Thank you.